Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to day two of CDAO Fall Virtual 2021. My name is Maiza Roberts. I am a conference director and head of programming here at Carinium, and it's a pleasure to welcome you back today. Remember that during our sessions, you can submit questions to our speakers using the Q&A button at the bottom of the page. You do not need to wait until the end Feel free to send us the questions as you think of them, and we'll do our best to get through as many as possible during Q&A time. You can also use the chat to share your thoughts on the content and interact with your fellow attendees. For any technical issues, we ask that you try to refresh your browser first. If that doesn't work, please go to the help desk under account. We'd also like to say a big thank you to all of our sponsors for your support. And to our audience, make sure to check out the Meet the Sponsors tab, where you're also able to request meetings with any of our solution experts at the event. Now, with that done, I would like to welcome our next speakers for the session, Using Your Data Warehouse for More Than Analytics. And please, I would like to welcome William Su, Customer Success Operations at Blend, and Kashish Gupta, Co-Founder and Co-CEO at Hightouch. William, Kashish, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Please do turn on your cameras and your audio and take over from here. Thank you. Hey, Maisa. Thanks for having us and everyone for joining us uh, for this talk. Um, yeah, the reason we thought about this topic is we were talking to a few of our larger enterprise customers that are public companies, and they always told us, hey, we spent a lot of money buying our data warehouse. What do we do with it now to prove value? And so we kind of have these conversations pretty often. Um, all of our customers are data warehouse users and really large ones. Um, and so we, we took that into thinking about how does the data team change over time? And how do you use the warehouse for more than post-processing analytics and more for operational workflows? And that's really what this talk is about. So excited to introduce um, William, who is one of our earliest customers. He is customer success ops at Blend. And um, they have some of the most innovative use cases for using the data warehouse that you'll ever see. Um, we actually did not even think about the creativity of powering things like Asana and Slack out, out, of, out of the data warehouse, but that was something that him and his team came up with. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear about those use cases from him. Will, if you wanna say like a quick intro. For sure. Uh, nice to meet you everyone. My name is William. I work at Blend under customer success operations. For those who do not know, Blend, we are a financial technology company. Specifically, we focus on making mortgage application software that makes the ability to apply for a mortgage faster, simpler, and more secure. And with that, I'll pass it back to you, Kashish. Thanks. And uh, Blend just had their IPO a couple months ago, so congrats to them on that. Um, and then I'm, I'm Kashish, one of the founders and co-CEOs of Hightouch. And we're a company that pioneered reverse ETL which is very simply the concept of getting data out of your warehouse and into your SaaS tools. So this talk is really um, quickly to run through the changes in data warehouse architecture that enabled data warehouses running operations, and then um, spending the bulk of our time on how to operationalize the data warehouse and turn that data warehouse into the source of truth for all your business teams. Um, and then lastly, just a little bit on how data teams will, might evolve over time and how you can kind of think about um, your data team over time becoming more of like the center of the business rather than like the end of a DAG where the data gets post-processed. Um, and then Will will take us through a little bit of their use cases and how their warehouse is being used to meet customer deadlines and also to make metrics more transparent within Blend. So really excited to hear about that from him. Um, so quickly jumping right in, um, the data warehouse today in most companies is primarily used for reporting. And you guys are probably all very familiar with this, that you might buy a warehouse, run queries in it overnight, and generate a BI report to be viewed every morning or every week. Um, and these insights are usually used to inform business decisions where someone might say, all right, here are my CAC metrics that I calculated in my data warehouse and inform marketing about those, that marketing can make better decisions to run better ads. Um, and that's traditionally how data warehouses work, where they're kind of like at the very end of the process in, in a data flow and the output is a report that is readable in something like Looker or Tableau. Um, and what we kind of, kind of hear pretty often from our customers is, how do I make more use of this data warehouse so that I can actually show um, the rest of my company why I spend millions of dollars buying um, this large scale infrastructure? And our answer is usually, hey, what if you use the data warehouse to actually power your SaaS applications um, and not just BI? 
So why do we now suddenly think that it's possible to use warehouse for, op for, for operations? It's because the warehouse is more affordable because you only pay for compute at query runtime. Um, it's also more accessible because it's on the cloud, you don't have to spin up your own data team to actually like maintain your Hadoop cluster and run your Spark queries. Um, oftentimes you can simply just ETL your data into an S3 bucket, stick that on Snowflake or BigQuery and boom, the data is just there ready for you to query with SQL. And lastly, it's faster than ever. So whereas previously um, most data warehouses were pretty slow and some still are, now with shared compute, you can actually just afford a lot more compute at once than you were able to before. And that allows queries to run oftentimes in minutes rather than in hours. Um, and, and this is, this is a, actually a fundamental shift that allows um, modern companies to think about the data warehouse as the center of a data workflow where data goes into the data warehouse, transforms post-process, and then goes back into SaaS tools and operational tools to actually create um, actions and um, workflows downstream. Uh, so a couple more things that enable this is ETL or ELT, where tools like Fiveframe make it really easy to get all of your data into the data warehouse. Um, and that's like a, a very simple replication of your production database or your SaaS applications in your data warehouse. But the beauty of it is that you now can do joins um, across all your applications in your data warehouse. And then data modeling is also a lot easier. So I'm guessing um, a lot of people here are thinking about adopting or have already adopted DBT. And we've actually um, seen a lot of users have success with DBT in high touch where they're able to just select their DBT models and then replicate those DBT models in their tools like Salesforce. And that's kind of like the concept that we're advocating for. We're advocating for the data team to build DBT models or any sort of data models, regardless of the tooling that you use. And then watch those models um, pipe into tools like Salesforce, Marketo, Zendesk, Gainsight, Google Ads, whatever you have, um, in order to see that data and allow your marketing team and your data and your and your sales team to use that data. And, and that's the concept that we're imagining is what if the warehouse was in the middle of, of this DAG and then pipe data to the CRM and then vice versa, the CRM also sends data back to the data warehouse through e normal ETL processes. Um, the cool thing about a system like this is that you actually see data pipelines that are bi-directional and so they inform one another where you could have um, through high touch some action created in the CRM like Salesforce opportunities created or um, marketing email sent out. And then the success of those emails would pipe back into the data warehouse to show you the metrics and based on those metrics, you could then take the next action, all automated. Um, and, and this is a bit different from the human processes that we usually see, where someone would, there would be a, there would be a big barrier here between the warehouse and the CRM, and some human would take the analysis in BI and convert that into some action in the CRM. Um, what we're really advocating for is can we automate this process and make the data warehouse inform CRM decisions? So the the other thing that happens here is that you can kind of imagine implementing SaaS tools in your company with a BYO database model, where you kind of just plug and play your data warehouse into your CRM and it just works. So um, one thing that we see people do pretty commonly is if they're adopting a new, a new tool, like if they're adopting Zendesk or Salesforce for the first time, what they'll do is they'll simply um, have their data already pre-modeled in their data warehouse and they'll replicate it in their new SaaS tool. Um, especially if it's, the models are pretty clean you can do this process in, in a few hours rather than a few months of implementation. And it really gives the data team full control because if you change your models in your data warehouse, those changes will automatically reflect in all the downstream SaaS tools. And then those models will replicate back into the warehouse and reflect there. So it's like, imagine if you could use SQL to change all of the data that was in your SaaS tools, that would actually be a, a pretty big di differentiator between how the world currently works where we use REST APIs to write to CRMs versus using SQL queries to write to, write to CRMs. Um, and that's kind of the model that we see people moving towards um, with, with these new robust ETL pipelines. Um, the reason why we advocate for data being in operational tools rather than staying stuck in the data warehouse is because when business users have access to that data in their CRMs, they're able to take action on it. So for example, um, they're able to take that data and then create workflows like Jira tasks for Salesforce opportunities on top of that data. Um, and Salesforce and other CRMs are the best place for them to manage that because those are the UIs that they're used to and the UIs that they live in. Um, so we generally say like what you want as a data team is instead of writing SQL queries all day, build good data models, get those data models into operational tools and let your business teams run with those there. 
Um, that way you're being asked for less SQL queries day to day, and you're being asked for more like long-term modeling work. And some of the ways that like, we kind of see this happening today is we, we see marketing teams do retargeting and conversion to ads. We, we see sales teams um, track consumption and product metrics in their CRM via this sort of model. And then we see customer success teams also tracking product usage and churn metrics um, in, in their customer success tool from the warehouse. And in all of these cases, you could totally imagine a world where the success team or the sales team does this by themselves, self-serve through some sort of um, Python script. But the cool thing about this is that this metric is controlled by the data team, which is the most well-suited team to actually calculate this metric um, and then provide this metric to the sales, marketing, and success teams. So like the idea is that the data team should hold that, um, that, that equation and they should edit it freely. And as it edits, um, it should reflect in the downstream tool rather than the other way around. Um, and then a couple more interesting use cases are like creating a Slack feed out of customers that became inactive. Um, and then also updating a Google sheet with all transactions live from the data warehouse. So oftentimes finance asks you for, give me all orders so I can just do a PNL. And they consistently ask for a CSV of that, of that download. Um, and here we can just automate that into a Google sheet that live updates every five minutes. Um, so my sales team would kill me if I didn't talk to, about, talk to you guys about this, but what we're, what we're really talking about here is reverse ETL, which is the concept of moving model data from your warehouse back into your SaaS tools. And this is something that Hightouch does um, right out of the box for free. Anyone can get started with it, self-serve. And we, we, we do this with a SQL query. So you provide Hightouch with a SQL query, you map the columns of that SQL query to the columns in your SaaS tool, and you just watch the data flow and it automatically gets diffed and we automatically do retries and we automatically log errors. So that's kind of the infrastructure that enables operate, operationalizing your data warehouse. Um, we totally also support companies building this in-house. And we think many of you guys have already built this kind of stuff in-house. Um, otherwise you wouldn't be able to operate things like your CRM. So what we, what we really think is that over time, um, if you want more business users to be able to create these pipelines rather than only the data team or only engineers being able to create these pipelines, um, that's when you would use a tool like Hightouch so that the sales ops person can come in, update the column mappings and add the new metrics to their CRM. That's kind of um, the self-serve world that we believe in. And a lot of customers have kind of trusted us with this as well. And some of them are listed here. Um, and then it, it, it fits into the stack pretty well where you have collection of events via something like Segment or Snowplow, collection of relational data via Fivetrain or Stitch, warehousing in Snowflake or BigQuery, transformation in DBT. And then the last missing layer is how do, what do we do after we do transformation in DBT and warehousing? Um, rather than just getting our data into analytics tools, can we use reverse ETL to also get it into all of our operational tools to run marketing campaigns, success campaigns, and so on. Um, and, and so we're actually saying that like in a best of breed world where people are spinning up their own data stacks, um, one should believe in having a specific tool for each of the steps and rather than having like a full stack tool that does everything. And th the idea here, here is to give you guys full control. So we want data teams to have control over the data pipelines in their company rather than handing that control over to someone like Informatica or, or a different SaaS tool. Um, and why, why are we advocating for something like this? It's, it's because we think data teams are the best suited team to actually like control these systems. Um, because you guys own the data warehouse and own data modeling on top of the data warehouse, um, you're, you're best suited to provide those metrics to the, each business team and also best suited to build this infrastructure so the business teams can then self-serve that data into their tools. Um, we think that the new CIO's office is actually gonna be much more like this, where the data engineering and analytics team because it becomes the center of it and naturally grows to power all the business teams like sales, marketing, and success. Um, and instead of like analytics being graded on, hey, is your data good quality? Does it work? Does it never break? And that kind of stuff. Um, we actually think data over time can be graded on things like, hey, like the data team made our business metrics go up. They increased revenue, they decreased churn, they um, increased activation of users from free to paid. Um, and those kinds of data workflows are like truly powerable from the data warehouse with the new changes in architecture. And if data can own some of those metrics and some of those business systems, um, we, we think that's a really good path forward for kind of centralizing these models and metrics in a company. Um, and we actually think this is better for everyone. 
because in, in a world without the data team taking on this leadership and owning those, 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 key, those key metrics, what happens is you have people using iPaaS tools and point-to-point -point integrations, and it kind of becomes a mess. So like you guys have all heard of data, data, the data mesh, and it is inevitable in most companies. But imagine if you could take that sort of data mesh where data is flowing in between a lot of point-to-point -point tools and just say, very, with, with, with a lot of discipline, let's just always get the data into the data warehouse. And from the data warehouse, we'll transform it, merge it together, make it really clean, and then get it back out. If, you, if we can have that kind of discipline, we can actually enforce the best practice that allows the data team to control those metrics and make sure those metrics are the right ones and the good ones. And also to um, make sure that when we replicate that data into our SaaS applications, that it's from the same data model. So we don't see a difference between what is in Salesforce but versus what is in something like LinkedIn or Marketo. Um, instead, we would actually see that the same models are there because they're all enforced by one source of truth. And that, that's kind of the, the model that we think the data teams will move towards. Um, and the goal here is that like, you've already set up ETL and you've already set up data modeling. So all the work has already been done. Just replicate those models into your SaaS tools, um, either in-house or using something like HighTouch. And this will help provide ROI for your data warehouse. Um, and this will, this will give data teams visibility into metrics going up and ownership of those metrics. So that when the sales team says, hey, like we need churn to go down, data says, okay, here's the operational workflow that will cause that to happen. And if that turns out to be correct, the OKR for data is that churn did indeed go down. Um, and so that, that, that's kind of the, the world that we're reimagining. And we'd love to get everyone else's feedback here on the practicalities, because we know it's a little bit idealistic, but in, in a couple of years, I think it'll become a lot more mainstream. Uh, and that, with that, I'll let Will take it away with Blend's use cases. Thank you. So I'm gonna go over how Blend has specifically implemented the solution within our own company. And for that, Kajis, could you move to the next slide? Yeah. First things that I want to talk about before going into implementation is what were the kind of problems we were facing prior towards this? And in my mind, there are really two problems that we were facing. First and foremost is the issue of data silos. So tools like Salesforce is a very rich data set for sales data. Tools like Asana is an incredibly rich data for project management. But by virtue of being their own platforms, it makes analysis that resides at the intersection of those two data sources. Like whether you want to look at hours spent on a project, how does that tie with a customer? Difficult to do. And if we needed to do any of that intersectional analysis, what this often meant was an individual would need to go into one platform, let's say Salesforce, and manually copy and paste fields into the other platform that has the other data they're interested in, let's say Asana. Now, the second approach towards this was also to build out in-house tools to do this. And this leads actually to the second problem we were facing. And Kashish, you can move on to the next slide. And that was that our in-house tools that were trying to automate this were relatively slow. We were building out things such as Zapier flows, Airflow DAGs with various Airflow operators and things of that sort. And this kind of in-house solution works well when let's say you only need to blend Salesforce and Asana data together. But as we grew larger as a company and we began to onboard more and more vendors that specialize in different domains and niches, it was costing our team more time and money, especially our data engineering team, to have to build out their own custom flows to get this data together into our warehouse. Now, those were the two problems we were facing. And with that, we can segue to the actual implementation that we did in order to solve this. And that was by adopting tools like Fivetran and HighTouch. Now specifically, we use Fivetran in order to easily bring in data from all the various SaaS platforms we're using. So Fivetran is used to bring in Salesforce data, Asana data, NetSuite data, in nice, clean, normalized manners within Amazon Redshift, our reporting warehouse. Within Redshift, we then use DBT to perform the necessary transformations on that data to one, clean up the data even more to make them really curated, but to really facilitate the creation of those insights that could only exist when you're blending Salesforce with Asana data and things of that sort. Within the warehouse, that's where we can standardize on metrics. And we can then use high touch in order to push these metrics out to your preferred platform. If you like using Slack to get your insights, we can send it there. If you like Salesforce, we can send it there. And one of those things, as you can imagine, provides a lot of benefits, and that's actually the next slide that I'll go over here. 
what were the benefits that we actually saw by implementing this kind of system? First and foremost, we had some very significant, clear, measurable impacts on our return on investment. One of the things that we needed to do for our finance team is to be able to provide with them accurate and timely data regarding how many hours our professional service team was providing for our customers. By implementing a flow based around Fivetron, DBT, and high touch, we were able to cut their monthly reporting down by four days, which you can imagine on a monthly scale is pretty substantial. Outside of directly measurable return on investments, this new kind of data infrastructure really allowed us to begin to do those really interesting insights that only resides at the intersection of data sources. And then finally, there's a lot of little cool things you can do with high touch that helps drive alignment uh, between teams. So for example, one of the things that we do at Blend is we can pull in project management data regarding hours, do transformations within our warehouse, and we can actually do like QCs, quality control checks on the data itself, saying, hey, as an individual, you log maybe 70 hours, but there's only 40 hours within a work week. That doesn't seem right. Within the warehouse, we can point that out, but then we can use a tool like High Touch to directly send a Slack ping to the individual who logged the 70 hours to say, hey, something looks a little fishy here. Can you go and double check that? And those kind of call to actions are incredibly effective by making sure that not only our entire company is working more effectively, but that our data quality is better, there's better alignment, and of course, an improvement to our overall bottom line. And with that, I'll pass it back to Kashish. And then one quick thing to mention is that like the vision of activating data and giving it to the hands of business users, it only happens if we're also able to build interfaces that the business users are able to use, right? So the, the original framework was take a SQL query and pipe that SQL query to any SaaS destination. Um, and, and therefore like any SQL user now can have access to this pipeline. Um, previously, it was just people that can code. Now it's any SQL user. But like, what if there was a UI that was actually even more abstracted that would work for people that don't know SQL? Um, that's kind of the next step. And, and we think um, that, that that is the, the place that we get really excited about where we're building an ORM on top of the data warehouse and an audience builder for kind of any marketing team to come in and build audiences. Things like user added to cart, but then did not purchase in seven days or give me all users in New York that are above the age of 40. Like those kinds of very simple queries um, that have pretty complex data models underlying, but are easy to express in a visual UI. Um, we, we actually have a UI now for marketers to be able to build those audiences self-serve without SQL, and then replicate those audiences in their ads, emails, and lifecycle marketing tools. Um, and, and the benefit there is that you actually want these definitions to be central and in the data warehouse. If you get, if you get that audience into your marketing tool like Braze, um, Braze can't send that data to, to your ad tool. So then it's just stuck in Braze and you can only take a couple of actions on it. Whereas if you build the audience upstream in the data warehouse, then you can propagate that audience automatically to your ad tools and your lifecycle marketing tools simultaneously. And as people enter or exit that audience, that change reflects downstream. So really like, like we're not really advocating for anything other than build your model centrally, which everyone does, but then propagate those models from the central source. That way the other tools can also be powered from that central source. And, and, and the world we think this creates is a, a much cleaner world where because there's central definitions, um, th there's not incongruency between these other systems and the other systems are also automated because they're able to take the feedback that, of the changing data in the data warehouse, which happens very often um, and reflect those changes. So that's um, generally like we see B2C companies doing that for ad destinations and lifecycle marketing destinations. Um, but really like the, the part of this that should be exciting to everyone here is can we move away from data teams writing SQL queries for marketing teams very often? Um, and can we instead build data models that have like all the data in a horizontal table and then let the marketing team build that audience themselves um, in order to make our job as data people more about modeling and less about SQL writing. And with that, um, that's the end of our presentation. We're excited to answer any questions you guys might have. Thank you, Kashish and William, for an excellent and very insightful presentation. We do have a couple of questions here for you and audience, feel free to chime in as well. Uh, first question is, 
what are some of the most common use cases of reverse ETL across different types of businesses? Example, B2B versus B2C uh, and functions and industries. What are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, um, I'll do, I can do B2B, B2C and then maybe uh, Will can do FinTech. So for us, um, we see B2B companies primarily getting data from the product database or data warehouse with product data um, into the CRM and success tools. So oftentimes what you'll see is a company that has any sort of like upsell motion, say, oh, user has now passed the threshold of the free plan to the pro plan, and they'll write a query to express that. And so that query will just be, give me all users that have had usage metric go up from like free tier to, to pro tier. Um, and then they'll power their, their Salesforce opportunities from that. They'll power um, an assignment of an account manager from that. They'll send the email to the customer based on that. And they'll also, um, give some sort of like product notification that says, hey, you, sh you have to pay within 30 days. And so those are the four actions they'll power out of the data warehouse, which traditionally, like a lot of these things you'd imagine as a product engineering task rather than a data warehouse task. Um, and then on the B2C side, what we see is people will often power marketing campaigns from their data warehouse. So they'll say, um, my data science team has really good metrics here for propensity to buy or risk of churn. And based on that, I want to toggle ad spend dynamically for users. So the people that are more likely to buy or more likely to churn, um, we want to send them more ads and put them into the bucket of like $10 ad spend instead of $1 ad spend. And they, they can automatically power um, sending those users to those ad campaigns. Um, and they can even power showing those users ads specific to the product SKU that they viewed within the app. So like the, the difference here is that because the data warehouse has all the data, not just the client side data, but the server side and all of the production data, um, Things that reflect based on like server side actions, like an order transaction failed or like some sort of like transaction is still processing, we can actually use those metrics rather than just the client side metrics. And then, Will, if you want to talk about fintech use cases, you know, Kajish, actually, it's it's like you're psychic. Everything you said are the exact kind of things that we're doing here at Blend. Um, nice. I th I think the real thing to add on to that is just the flexibility. Meaning this kind of platform allows you to really think up of any use case that you have. You can get really creative with how you want to drive insights from your warehouse into actionable tasks because you're in control of the SQL query versus prior methods. You're really reliant on what other people are saying. You should do this. You should do that. When you adopt this, the world's your oyster. Yeah. And that's actually something um, we love about being built on the data warehouse because we're not limited by the data schema or, or the data store that we provide. Um, you bring your own and you can control that fully. So you could totally delete all the tables and then change them entirely and write new SQL queries. And it would still work because it's all abstracted. Um, and, and for at the enterprise, this is actually crucial. Um, you wouldn't be able to adopt a tool that um, has a pres prescribed schema because it would never fit all of your business needs. And you'd be transforming your data to fit their schemas rather than the other way around. Wonderful, thank you. Thank you, William. Thank you, Kashish, once again. And we're right at the 145 mark, so I'm gonna have to wrap up, but please make sure that you join our speaker meet and greet at 3 p.m. if you wanna ask more questions. Uh, it's a great chance to ask questions directly of our speakers and a great opportunity to network. Uh, thank you again for your time and for joining us, William and Kashish. Now we're continuing with the program and coming up next, we have a panel discussion on overcoming the ROI challenge on AI and ML initiatives to secure long-term investment. Well, stay tuned, take care for now, and I'll see you soon.